showtime. Now we, oh, now it's showtime. okay. Now it's now we're live. Now, now okay. we're live. Calling Chris Anderson in uh, London. I'm in London. Yes, actually, believe it or not, I am in London. And calling Rick Byer, you're not in Chicago, are you? I am not in Chicago. I am in Luxembourg. Wow, that's a role reversal, huh? At the at the house of my friends Tim and Natalie, who have uh, are been nice enough to put me up. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I've been here. I, I spent some time after our master class uh, touring some uh, market garden sites with Matt Brogy. And uh, now I'm down here for some Ghost Army meetings and then back to Chicago on Tuesday. Chicago, Chicago. So how are your meetings? You got them all done? Uh, no, my meetings are tomorrow. So we'll see. Oh, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. Hey, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a variety of history tours. Where, Chris Anderson? Oh, where? Um, the Pacific? Yeah. And Euro Europe? Uh, and the U.S.? All over the United States. And uh, we'll out. find some other places to go. Give us time. StephenAmbroseTours.com. And whether you're watching live or watching on replay or listening on the HHH podcast. Thank you for joining us. Today we'll be talking about the lost paratroopers of Normandy. Fascinating story and really excited about that. Let us know you're here and what you're, what you're drinking. Uh, and Chris, who is here? Do we have anybody we know? Well, well Ron uh, Griswold is here. Nancy Nylance is here. Uh, Ken Hattrop. And Ken means Ken got home from the master class. That's good. Doreen is here. I see Jim Stark and yeah. Janine Bowe and Ross from uh, uh, Richmond. And uh, yeah, many, many other people. So it's glad to have them all here. And we especially want to thank everybody who supports us uh, via Patreon. Uh, especially our top shelf patrons. And uh, you can help keep the History Taps running by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash history happy hour. And if you become a top shelf patron, Chris, for a $20 charge there, you do get a free hat. And what's, what's going to be better than that? I mean, so you pay money and you get a free hat. And that <laughs> if that doesn't represent <laughs> capitalism, you know. I, 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 just want, I just want to add, though, that uh, one of our top shelf patrons, Amanda Morris. Thank you. I'm drinking your gin tonight, by the way. So thank you. Oh, okay. I am. I'm gonna. I'm saving what I'm drinking until uh, until we have our guests. But I, I think um, we've we we now have reached the point, Chris, where yeah, we, we probably have to actually do a show here. Oh, so, right. uh, what do you think? Why don't you give me a, a Why don't you give me a lead in for that? Opening? All right. Bing. Bing. Bing, no bell today. <laughs> the bell did not make it to Luxembourg. But the bar mm. is open. And Chris Anderson, what is on tap today? Yeah, we have a great show uh, this week. We have uh, Dr. Stephen Robb, and he is a professor of history emeritus, I guess now you would say, at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, and he's most known for his uh, work on American foreign policy and, and foreign policy in Latin America, except for this week, where he's going to be talking about his new book, The Lost Paratroopers of Normandy. Uh, and so he's bringing not only his academic expertise to this really fascinating story, but he has a bit of a personal connection to it, too, which we'll get into. So, uh, yeah, excited to talk about it. Steve Ray, Hello. welcome to History Happy Hour. Thank you very much. And um, I'm here, in, though I taught for 40 years at the University of Texas at Dallas. I retired in Oregon, so I'm in the middle of wine country. And so I have a nice Pinot Noir from. Oh, oh, fantastic. And I'm right on that same page with you because I have a nice uh chateau uh neuf de pape and it's a vintage 1990 and my glass has a luxembourg map on it oh that's an awful big glass work yeah well so the questions are going to get a little more <laughs> off color as we get further on in the show assuming i drink that whole glass mm -hmm. yeah. well so Steve, I, I want to ask you when i first saw the title of the book um i said the lost paratroopers of normandy and um I would thought that given um, all that's been written about the airborne troops in Normandy, that it would be hard to find some paratroopers that were actually lost, but you seem to have done that and you're kind of bringing a story that hasn't uh, gotten a lot of coverage to light. So um, just kind of really briefly, we'll get into the weeds of it, but kind of what drew you to the story and, and who are we talking about? Who are these lost paratroopers? 
Well, these, these particular paratroopers as a group are the most off target. Uh, most paratroopers were a bit off target on D-Day, but this group, it was nine sticks of men from the 82nd Airborne, the 507th Regiment of the 82nd Airborne, one stick from the 101st, and uh, then there was a, a glider plane with four people from the 101st. So ultimately about 165 paratroopers landed about 20 miles off target near a small unoccupied rural village of Gren, uh, which is uh, about 10 kilometers from uh, the port town of Karata, about 40 miles, 25, 30, no, maybe about 30 miles from where Omaha Beach was. So this particular group of people were the most off target. Lost is a bit of a misnomer because relatively quickly they figured out where they were, but they, they also quickly realized they weren't anywhere near where they were supposed to be, uh, which was to be uh, near, uh, uh, near the small village of Amfreville, which is just west of St. Marie Agli. Uh, so um, uh, those are the men who are there, about 165. And it's, the basic story is what, what, what did they do when they found out that they were so far off target? And the bigger part of the story is how did the people of the village of Gren uh, react to the uh, surprise of 165 paratroopers landing near what one, one citizen told me is, I always thought we lived at the end of the earth. What, 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 all of a sudden, why are all of these paratroopers here? So uh, let, let's try to walk through this, the basics of this story. Uh, you know, so you have 160 plus uh, paratroopers uh, who suddenly uh, sort of show up uh, in this village. The village is kind of located on a hilltop. Um, what's this experience like for the, for the paratroopers and, and for these villagers who, of course, are nowhere near, uh, you know, the water, nowhere near where there's tons of other paratroops landing? Right. Most, most of the, uh, now where they landed, most of the paratroopers landed in the swamps or what is called the Marae. This is very much lowland country and normally floods. But then, of course, as we know, the Germans had backed up the rivers. And so the flooding was, was quite extensive throughout Normandy. And many of the paratroopers landed in water. And uh, unfortunately, a few of them drowned as they became tangled up in their parachutes. Now, at 50 meters, the village was located at a height of about 50 meters above this lowland area in which there was a very prominent church. So gradually all of the men who were scattered all around the, the village of Gren made their way to the uh, village. And the basic dilemma for them was what do we do? The commanding officer made the, made the decision that they really could not get back 20 miles, that they couldn't carry their heavy equipment such as their mortars uh, to support the infantry companies. And so they decided to stay in the village of Gren and wait for the men at Omaha Beach to reach them. Now, in making this decision, they were thoroughly encouraged by the people of the village who asked them to protect the paratroopers to protect them. This was an unoccupied village, but there are paratroopers everywhere, uh, excuse me, Germans everywhere in the area. And so they asked the paratroopers to defend them. And this request was backed up by the initiative that they showed. They went out into the Marais and they retrieved all of the paratroopers equipment. And then the big issue would be, well, what are we gonna do for food? The women of the village organized themselves, volunteered and organized themselves to uh, initiate a cooking campaign for, for all of the 165 paratroopers in which they promised two hot meals a day and they organized an around-the-clock, 24-hour cooking campaign. This involved, over the next several days, women surreptitiously entering occupied villages, purchasing additional food supplies, and then passing right through German checkpoints with all of this food, where they would, they would have a wagon, a horse-driven wagon, and they'd have all the food hidden under straw. Um, and so the people of the village also, beyond retrieving all the equipment that was out in the Marais, they found the five light machine guns they had, the 281 millimeter mortars. They also carried out reconnaissance missions for the paratroopers. They provided the paratroopers with intelligence. Um, and they kind of thoroughly pledged their, their loyalty and, and fidelity to people that they, to this very day, they simply refer to as the liberators or our paras, our paras that they simply bonded with the paratroopers and in turn the paratroopers bonded with the villagers. 
in a large sense, my story, The Lost Paratroopers of Normandy, and the subtitle is A Story of Resistance, Courage, and Solidarity in a French Village, is a story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And it's not only telling yeah, what happened, but also trying to probe the motivation. Why did they act this way? Why did they put their lives at risk? Because this is this is certain execution if you are captured by the Germans aiding uh, the Allied landing. So see, I, I think one of the things that kind of struck me in the book is it's very, um, to me, it was very personality driven. I mean, there are some people that, that kind of really keep the story moving along and are central to what happens. But, and I, and I want to kind of hit each of the parts of the story as we go through the show, but why don't we start with, um, with the people in uh, the headquarters company? Could you tell us a little bit about um, kind of their background and, and the makeup of the company and who some of these people were? I know you go into that sure. quite a bit in the book. Right. I mean, when I use the term ordinary, I mean, obviously the 82nd Airborne and paratroopers have a certain legendary status today. But most of these young men who joined, um, uh, who, who volunteered to be paratroopers, did so for one special reason. Uh, they needed the extra $50. Almost all of them <laughs> were children, the paratroopers were children of the Great Depression. Uh, many of them couldn't finish high school, uh, not because they didn't want to, but because of the economic circumstances. Some only had an eighth grade education. Of the officers, most only had maybe a year of college and they uh, wanted they wanted, they enjoyed college, but they couldn't complete it. So they joined uh, to, to be paratroopers to, to um, basically for the extra money. As I've often told people, one of the interesting findings I found out is most paratroopers didn't actually like jumping. And some of them said they were scared to death every time they jumped. Uh, that, that we have a certain sense that there's a great deal of bravado, et cetera, but they actually didn't like to jump, but they did like the extra $50 a month. An average, a uh, soldier only made about $20 a month. And then when you put in another $50 a month for combat pay, the paratroopers were making as much as a mid-level British officer in terms of pay. So right. they were very ordinary people. However, they're highly intelligent. In order to be a paratrooper, you had to score on the standardized test, a score high enough to qualify you to be an officer. Because the, the kind of the brain behind the paratroopers, of course, is Major General James Gavin. And he felt that paratroopers had to show enough initiative. And here you see General Gavin himself showing initiative, patrolling by himself. He's a major general patrolling out on the outskirts. And this was a scene often seen by the paratroopers. He wanted highly intelligent men. And as it turns out, most of these paratroopers were also extremely ambitious. They wanted to be somebody. And they, had, they were badly damaged, their lives were badly damaged by the Great Depression. It was amazing to me as I probed in terms of who these 160 men were, most of the men had lost a parent. Um, and so you know, they had very, very difficult lives. They'd been helped by Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, but they wanted to be somebody and they, they needed more money uh, and they were highly intelligent men. Most of them did quite well in the post-war world. Now, most people did because of the prosperity. So they, they were ordinary people who'd been beset by life, who were, who were very, very energetic. Uh, Steve, so uh, if we might as well be balanced here. If those are the guys in the, in the unit, tell us a little bit about some of the leadership in this town. And you've especially spoken about some of the women who, who were very, um, who were very active in, in, in supporting the, the idea that we're going we're gonna to rally to these paratroopers, to our paras, and we're going to help them. All right. Now, this is a village of 900 people. Uh, it has a 12th century church. Uh, it would be fair to say that some of the people's people could trace their ancestry back a thousand years in this small village. It was mainly an agricultural village in terms of uh, the Normandy cows, as well as producing the uh, calvados from the uh, the pears and apples that the, uh, in their orchards, 100% um, Catholic, probably fairly conservative. Uh, this region of Normandy uh, voted for the conservative groups in, in the 1930s elections. Um, they had a lot of grievances. Uh, you know, the mayor of, of the village said it's very important. I, he said that this village is unoccupied. So it gave them the opportunity in their local cafe to meet together and grouse about what they didn't like. 
And what didn't they like about what they called the Boches all around, the Germans? They didn't like the fact that the Germans were in France. Most of the men who were middle-aged in the, in the village were veterans of World War I. Um, the village had lost a lot of men during World War I. Uh, they didn't like the fact that there were some of their sons were prisoners of war in Germany. They didn't like the fact that beginning in 1943, the Germans were trying to force young men into compulsory labor and transport them to Germany. Uh, they didn't like the fact that the amount of food was being restricted in terms of the rationing system. They didn't like the fact that the, the Germans were taking their livestock or stealing their cows or stealing their milk, etc. But when, when I probed that all of these things are true, but when I asked people, well, why did you risk your life in order to aid the paratroopers? They would say, they'd almost look incredulous at me and say, well, what type of question is that? These people came to save us. These people came to liberate us. Of course, we're going to help them. In addition, um, they basically said, well, we believe, why did you do this? Because we believe in um, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Put it in another way, they believed in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's, in the end, the answer that people gave me. Now, there's one other thing here. That the paratroopers all landed in this very remote village, or what they considered remote, in the Marais, in the swamps, seemed to many of them, because they're very religious people, that it was a sign from God. Um, uh, at the 20th anniversary in 1964, the parish priest compared the paratroopers coming to Bren to Jesus, or God sending his only son Jesus to earth, that they felt they had received a sign. Uh, and, they, and it kind of sends almost how, how they deified the paratroopers or what the people they call our power, our powers or the liberators. So a whole variety of reasons came together, I think, and to me, as an historian, kind of trying to probe the motivations of the various people, why they did what they did, um, it came down to some very specific things. But, but when you probe a little bit deeper, they said, well, these people came to save us. Well, of course, we're going to help them. And beyond yeah, but, that, we believe in life, life uh, you know, equality and fraternity, liberty, equality and fraternity. Well, yeah, Steve, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but to kind of expand on what you just said, you know, Rick and I have both spent an awful lot of time in Normandy. I'm very close friends with a lot of Normans. I know a lot of Normans. I've been to a lot of Norman villages. Gren seems to be just that little bit different, though. I mean, you don't see villages rallying around people like they did. Is there something that you think set them apart or or there was was there like a secret sauce there that made this village a little bit different? Well, you're quite right. They are set apart. The, the mayor, the former mayor, a longtime mayor of uh, Gren, Dennis Small, said this is the only village in which there is 100 percent cooperation with the Allies. Right. There are a handful of people who might leave the village. They don't want to be part of what's going on. But no one uh, seeks to undermine what in terms of the support of the powers. So why? Why? Well, all I can give you again is all these kind of factors. The, the mayor thought that the two key reasons were that it was an unoccupied village, which gave people a chance to kind of organize prior to uh, uh, June 6, 1944. And the fact that the paratroopers just came to, to a place that people considered the ends of the earth. Right. And it, it just was a sign, we must act, we must act. Um, but again, when I talked to people, they said, well, I believe in, we believed in liberty, equality, and fraternity. They believed in the ideals of the French Revolution. Now, normally we think of resistors as being people on the left. And these are not necessarily people on the left. I should also point out that in 1940, the villagers aided fleeing British soldiers, uh, trying to help them to get to Dunkirk. In the case of the Rigaud family, who's the most famous for hiding 21 uh, paratroopers in their barn for three days. In 1940, they hid a couple of British soldiers for a couple of days. There, there is a Gustave Rigaud and Martin Rigaud, the, the uh, mother and father of the Rigaud family. And uh, uh, Gustave is a veteran of World War I, still carries German shrapnel at his knee. But they helped 
uh, British soldiers trying to flee. And what they did is they provided them with some agricultural implements and some clothes so they could, they were hoping they could pass through German lines as, as peasants. So they did have this history of resistance. Now there's no strong formal resistance or movement within, within uh, the town. But again, there is this kind of this simmering discontent and it's often at a very local level. Uh, in the Rago family, they have two cows and the Germans were taking the product of one of their cows. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal to them. Uh, it's making life more difficult. Um, so for four or five days, it's kind of like Shangri-La in uh, Normandy. And you have the townspeople and the paratroopers uh, cooperating. The paratroopers are setting up defenses, you know, just in case. And just in case ends up happening. That is to say that the Germans uh, end up showing up there uh, uh, eventually. And so how does that happen? What, what leads to the Germans uh, uh, coming to this village? And who are the German soldiers who, who approach this village on the morning of June 11th? Right. Two or three points. One, just to, I might, in terms of the bonding that takes place from June 6th to June uh, 10th in the village, um, the children bring the food to the paratroopers who are often in the foxholes. And then the children stay and they tell stories and they sing. And um, I, we've been to the home of Mark Rigaud, who's now 90, who was 12 at the time. And though she does not speak English, she does know the words to the, it's, a, it's a long way to Tipperary. And we sang at the dinner table, it's a long way to Tipperary, where the, where the soldiers and, and the children exchange songs and stories. Now, in terms of the Germans, there is a, a new division of Waffen SS, the 17th division, that is about 250 miles uh, to the southeast. On D-Day, they receive orders from Central Command in, uh, in, uh, in Normandy that they are to move their division northward towards the, the port town of Carata. Now, Carata, which is a, is, sets a stride um, um, Omaha Beach and Utah Beach is considered an absolutely critical place to hold. It was held by the Germans. It's attacked. It's being attacked by the 101st Airborne. And so the 17th Waffen SS is moving from 7 June on towards Karata. Guren is right, right in the way. Now, the paratroopers are unaware of this. Indeed, by by June 9th, June 10th, they think the plan is is working because they've had a, some minor contact with, with Germans. Uh, but two men who had landed at Omaha Beach wandered into the village. How, how they got there, I'm not sure, et cetera. But it seems like well, to them that, that the people of Omaha Beach are, are getting pretty close to them. And then they can, they can then be they themselves almost liberated. And then they can move on to perhaps find where, where the 82nd Airborne is. So it's this sort of development. and But the... The Waffen SS, the 17th Waffen SS, is slowly moving. They're not making the progress they'd hoped to because they're being buzzed by Mustang airplanes, et cetera, and things are far more difficult, and there's no Luftwaffe to protect them, et cetera. But unbeknownst to the paratroopers, until about 10 June, they do not know that a whole division of troops is moving to what is essentially a company, which is about the size of a company that the paratroopers have, and the perimeter defense. So, so, oh, are you going to go? No, no, Chris, oh. go ahead. So, um, again, you know, there's a lot about this story uh, that is sort of untypical. So it's untypical that you have all the French villagers rally around them in the way they do. One of the other things that's sort of unusual uh, is that all these paratroopers come down in and around this town. They gather there. Uh, in a lot of other cases, the paratroopers would say, well, our mission is Carentan or our mission is St. Marigolese. I'm heading that way. They don't hear. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, uh, a man named Johnson and a man named Blumentritt and, uh, and a kind of a discussion they have of why the decision is made that we're just going to stay here at this village. I think there there is a furious debate between the senior officer, Major Johnston, and the second ranking officer, um, Captain Brummett, about whether, what should they do. Captain Brummett argued our mission, we are a headquarters company with weapons like, like uh, the 81 millimeter mortars that we need to go find our three infantry companies in our battalion and we need to support them. 
And the debate between Johnston and uh, Brummett is qu apparently quite acrimonious. And the other officers are really quite alarmed that there's, there's yelling going on between the two superior officers. But the end, obviously, Major Johnston uh, uh, wins the argument because he is the superior officer. It seems to me there, there there's two or three things that he raises. One, he says, we're 20 miles away. We just can't get through all of the swamps, et cetera. We can't do it. Two, we wouldn't be able to carry our 81 millimeter mortars. Three, the men had been somewhat traumatized by the fact that four or five of them drowned uh, in the murder, where they got, you know, a lot of them had been deeply frightened by the fact they went underwater, popped out slashed at their risers and got out of them. But four or five men couldn't get entangled in their, in their paratroops. And so they, the, there you see a, a drowned paratrooper. Uh, this was quite traumatic. Some of, surprisingly, some of the paratroopers did not swim. And there was a fear that, that they would lose more men. Besides, we can't carry our equipment. So that would not be a good idea. But the key thing is, is that the paratroopers reacted to the enthusiasm of the villagers. Here, it, here our villagers are making history. Uh, by the fact that they were prepared to cook for the paratroopers, to find their equipment, and because they implored them to protect them, to protect them. And so, so from Major Johnston's point of view, it made sense just to wait to see if the men from Omaha Beach reached them. And indeed, by Friday, June 9th, two men had actually wandered in from the 29th Infantry. Um, and so it seemed, the plan seemed to be working. Clear. Now, the problem with, with as a perimeter is this is a small company without air support, without artillery support, um, without tank support, without any way to resupply themselves. And in the end, the fact that they will run out of ammunition when they're attacked on June 11th is the key factor. Um, these are things that, that Captain Brummett had raised. Uh, that we, you know, we, you know, in addition, he pointed out that this is not an exactly infantry. This is a support. It's headquarters company, basically. This is a support group who who have uh, organic weapons, uh, machine guns, and um, mortars. But basically, about ten of the men are medics, and they're unarmed. This, you know, this is a support group. And other men are in communication, and it was a fear that they couldn't really act as infantrymen. They hadn't been trained as infantrymen, et cetera. The one stick of the 101st is infantrymen. Uh, but overall, uh, although Captain Brummett will later say, I was wrong about this, they proved to be superior fighters, the troopers. Well, and I so should emphasize it seems to be very good until all of a sudden the 17th Waffen SS are right on the outskirts of. Uh, so, but. Uh, once they make this plan to defend the village, I just want to kind of emphasize or confirm that they're completely out of touch with everybody right. back behind they, them. They, 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 nobody they, else. They have no, no contact. They brought with them two carrier pigeons. There's high technology here. <laughs> and so they, they put a message on one carrier pigeon that this is where we are. Can you help us? And the carrier pigeon actually was found by the 82nd Airborne dead. Apparently, Germans shot the carrier pigeon down or whatever. And they found the information that they're at this particular place. And they gave them the coordinates, et cetera. And they, the 82nd put out a kind of broadcast to anybody, any unit in the area, to try to help these men. But there's no one, no, no one near them. Um, as it turned out, the second the second pigeon was making too much noise as the attack up, was about to take place, so it was sacrificed by the paratroopers <laughs> for, for security reasons. So but, uh, that, that was what they had. They had they had a they had a pigeon, a carrier <laughs> pigeon. Two men landed with carrier pigeons. So the seventeenth Waffen SS, which we should emphasize, is a, a new division composed of you know mostly a very young, probably very fanatical uh, stormtroopers. Uh, they launched an attack on June 11th. So give us an idea of uh, this, this attack happens in three phases. Give us a sense of, of what happens in the course of this attack. Right. The first attack probably, w almost certainly was not the Waffen SS. The first attack was probably Germans in the area, because over time, the Germans are learning that there was a force of Americans there. 
And it seems that most of the people who attacked on the morning of Sunday, June 11th, a lot of the men were at church when, when the alarm was raised that the village was under attack, seem to have been Ukrainians who had been, and, and Russians who'd been uh, Shanghaied and drafted into the uh, uh, regular German army. This is a, an enormous victory for the paratroopers. Some people estimate that they killed several hundred of these attackers. They had the high ground, obviously, in, in, the, in the village of Grand, and they easily repelled the attack. The second attack takes place in the afternoon, and this is the one carried out by the Waffen SS. It's a kind of probing attack. They inflict some casualties on the paratroopers. The paratroopers have to bring their defenses in closer to the village. Um, it's a kind of a standoff with the Waffen SS. And the third attack, but by the end of, this, of, of the second attack, the paratroopers are running out of ammunition. The third attack occurs in the evening of Sunday, June 11th, in which the um, Germans employ heavy weapons, um, uh, artillery-like pieces, um, and they uh, storm the village, and the paratroopers have to withdraw after suffering a significant number of casualties, uh, probably about 30 dead of the 160 are dead, uh, although the Waffen-SS will then capture some of the uh, paratroopers and execute them. Well, and, and I want to just, I want to maybe uh, touch on that for a moment, that the aftermath of this is, and maybe you can give us some numbers, uh, is that not only are paratroopers executed, but civilians in the village who helped them, the people who made up this happy Shangri-La a few days before, they are also executed by the Waffen-SS. The, the, the lost paratroopers of Normandy, the battle is only the middle part because what happens after the battle is as important and as significant to understand. The um, paratroopers in the end had run out of ammunition. They were taking significant casualties they had been doing very well with their 81 millimeter mortars and their and their five machine guns. They'd been inflicting significant casualties, but they simply ran out of ammunition. When the Waffen SS stormed the village, the, most of the men began to most of the paratroopers began to withdraw, but they had left behind some wounded people. Given this was a headquarters company, there were many medical people, and there was a battalion surgeon a captain, had left people behind who were tending to the wounded. When the Waffen-SS came to the village, they uh, rounded up the severely wounded people. They bayoneted them and forced them into a pond. Some of them, some of the men were still alive. In terms of the uh, those who were still ambulatory or were simply had fallen to be prisoners of war, the Waffen-SS marked uh, uh, simply murdered them. They marched them away a couple miles away. They forced them to dig graves, and they then shot them in the back of the head. So overall, the Waffen SS uh, probably, in terms of war crimes, murdered about 20 uh, paratroopers. So that their total casualties was about 50 paratroopers of the 165 or so. Uh, but also, because the the um, wounded were being tended to in the sacristy of the church, which had now been damaged by the long range uh, uh, sort of artillery that the Germans were shooting at the, at, at, the, at the village, that they charged that the priest, his acolyte, there's a, there is the church now destroyed, and there is uh, Father Leba Arshan, that he had been tending to the wounded. He and his acolyte had been tending to the wounded. They are both executed. In addition, the two housekeepers are also executed. They also lined up about 50 citizens and asked them, well, how, how did you cooperate? How did you aid the um, uh, paratroopers? Not one person said anything. Not one person said anything. And some of them, such as the woman who, who owned the cafe and organized the women's campaign to feed the paratroopers, would just sass them back. Assessed that, look what you are doing to our village. Look how you have hurt our village. Look how you have hit our houses. Look how you have hit our church. I mean, it's just amazing. They just sass back these people. So they murdered four, four civilians 
and they executed uh, uh, 20 Americans, about 20 Americans, and another 30 died from battlefield wounds. Uh, now, the people, many of the people who were executed were, were not, not only the unarmed priests and, and the housekeepers, but also the medics who were not carrying weapons, mm -hmm. as was, of course, not the battalion surgeon. We have some evidence uh, that uh, the battalion surgeon, when the, the Waffen SS entered the village, came out of the sacristy and waved a, a white flag and tried to indicate that this was medical personnel, but it seemed to make no difference. Um, as a, a historian I admire has written about the massacre at Malmedy uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, Stephen Remy has said that the Waffen SS um, carried out um, terror war, terror war. Yeah. So, um, and subsequent to my publishing the book, I've been able to identify the person who um, supervised the murder of nine people who had to dig their own graves and then were shot in the back. Um, he was of the opinion that the uh, all of any soldiers that were captured were subject to, to execution, particularly if they were near the church, because the church, initially in the belfry of the church, the head of the mortar group, the Lieutenant Farnham, was directing fire of the two mortars two mortars, the 281 millimeter mortars. So he said that they had that they had uh, violated this, the sanction or violated the sanctuary of the church and so that everyone should should have the right to, uh, they had the right to murder everyone. Now, the reason that we know about this now is that this man had been captured um, and became a prisoner of war. This German uh, SS uh, non-commissioned officer had be been captured and um, he had been transported to the United States, and his presence had been wiretapped, and he used to brag to other Germans about what he had done. He had been previously involved in the massacres at Ledici in uh, the Republic of Czechoslovakia. Uh, so uh, we know, it, but basically it's sort of terror war, terror war that they're pursuing. Ultimately, the Waffen-SS and the Germans will force all the people out of the village, and they will have to go in exile for about six weeks. They'll be on, on, you know, on village roads looking for places to stay, etc. And they will torch the village, and most of the village will be burned down. Um, so now, the, the other key thing to remember here, why the story continues, is that by about June 14th, about 90 paratroopers had made it to Karatak. Uh, they had been helped and aided and escorted by villagers uh, on their retreat. In addition, another 21 paratroopers were hidden in a barn for three days. One of these paratroopers was my father. And the barn was surrounded. At a certain point, Germans came into the, into the barn, but didn't go up into the loft. And the paratroopers were hidden for three days by the Rigaud family, uh, and when they could, they surreptitiously fed the paratroopers and then ultimately found a man who, who punted a large boat, boat, a canal boat through the canals and got them to Karata by June 15th, June 16th. So that the, the, the villagers kept faith with our paras and probably saved the lives of out of 110 paratroopers. Well, I think, I think I want to talk about that some more. I mean, um, so... They've had this Alamo stand. The, the Americans have said, we'll stick by you. But after three attacks, they said, you know something? It's time to go. Uh, but you would think, again, in a lot of situations, the people would say, hey, thanks very much. Uh, but they stick by them. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit more about that decision to support them, even after their protectors leave and continue to support them. Because what's at stake for these French families by continuing to support them? And then what do they do to help these paras get out? All right. Well, we just take the case of the barn, of the Rigaud barn, of which there, which are, there are 21, there, there is the Rigaud barn. It's a very large barn. You don't get quite a sense of that from this particular photograph. And the there are 21 paratroopers up in the law. If the Rigaud family was, was caught aiding the paratroopers or hiding them, they wouldn't have all been immediately executed. This is a family with a little Jean-Claude who's only two years old, three years old. Everyone's life is at risk. Um, initially, the two daughters, Odette, 19, and Mart, who's 12, found paratroopers hiding in the marais, hiding in the bushes, hiding in the hedgerows, 
and brought them to the barn and then told her parents, then told their parents, oh, mom and dad, guess what? Uh, but also the parents were sympathetic to this. Um, at one point, as I noted, the uh, some Germans entered the barn looking for paratroopers who were fleeing. The 21 paratroopers um, up, in, up in the loft of the barn all aimed their guns. One pulled the pin out of his hand grenade. If conflict had broken out, it would have been catastrophic for the um, Rigaud family uh, that they had been hiding these 21 men. Uh, helping helping uh, the people escape would have been catastrophic if they had been identified. As it turned out, the, the young man who punted the canal boat, the large canal boat through the canals and got the 21 to safety on June 15th, 16th, he ultimately was identified and presumably was executed by the Germans. Uh, so why would they risk all? Well, again, the answers were, these people came to save us. Of course we're going to help them. Of course we're going to help them. Um, and I guess after, you know, by 1943-44, the frustration with the occupation is just so deep among the people of this village. Now, again, the people in the village, almost everyone is related to everyone else. They all share kind of common uh, world perspectives. Uh, they all had been deeply affected by World War I. They all did not want the people they call, it's a derogatory term, the Bosch or the Boches in their, their presence. I mean, there are all of these reasons, but I know it's in, in our sort of deeply polarized ideological times, it's hard for us to believe that people believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They believe, it, they believe in liberty, equality, and fraternity, and they acted on it. I mean, you know, I'm an academic historian. I'm always looking for underlying issues, but the issue is right there. This is why they did it. This is why they did it. Um, you, uh, Steve, you, 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 you kind of tossed off a mention of this, but um, you know, obviously, one of the reasons you wrote this book is your father was one of these soldiers. So maybe tell us a little bit about about him, and I think he's in this picture. Uh, right. and, and about how, how, how long you've uh, been working on this or, or, or when you decided to, uh, when, when you found out about it and, and how long between that and when you decided to work on the book. Right. My father is the bigger guy here in the uh, sweater and ultimately uh, about my father as a paratrooper. Why did he join? He joined, the, joined for money. He joined for the adventure. He was very ambitious, hadn't finished high school. Um, uh, what I would just simply like to say about my father is four, three, two, one, four, four, four bronze stars, uh, uh, three battlefield promotions. He ended up as a staff sergeant, two purple hearts, and one amputated toe left behind in Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. Now, what I had learned about this, why did I write about this? I had known about, you know, the, the, the question could be, why did I wait so long to do it? Well, it's because basically- I was Well, I'm way too polite to ask that question. <laughs> Basically, I was on the academic, you know, once I became an academic, I always thought I would write about this story. But once I got on the academic carousel, I was treated very nicely. I, I became a full professor. I had a doubt chair. I, I could go anywhere in the world to do research, et cetera. And I was invited to do things, invited to write books, et cetera. So I kept postponing it. So it was only after I retired. Now, what I knew about, about the story, because my father was rather different than most of veterans of World War II. Most veterans of World War II really weren't talking about their experiences until they got into their 60s or 70s. My father talked a great deal about it to, to my three uncles who were World War II veterans but were not combat veterans. He would let me listen in. I also attended reunions with him. Mm. And in terms of Guerin, what he had told me was that he had been hidden in a barn by a farm family for three days and that they hadn't eaten he was ravishing, ravish, ravishly hungry, and that the farm family had cooked some cabbage and butter for the paratroopers. And he always said, this is the best meal I ever had. And he would always raise this issue when I or my brother or my sister wasn't eating the, the, the nicely cooked meal by my mother. And he would bring this issue up about how you should be grateful uh, to eat. Now, sure. it was only, my father, it was only one story. And it kind of, I knew about the story, but he didn't know all about Grin because 
my father, like all the other 110 men who survived, had seven weeks of combat in Normandy. Then they had seven weeks of combat in the Battle of the Bulge. And always, my father tended to talk more about that because of the cold. I mean, that made the biggest impression on him. Then they jumped over the Rhine River and had seven more weeks or so of, of uh, combat in the Rhineland area. They liberated tens of thousands of slave laborers. Then my father did six months of occupation duty in Berlin. In Berlin. So there was this just kind of endless numbers of incidents and everything kind of, kind of merged in his mind. So he never really dwelled on the issue of Gren. But as it turned out, you know, once I finally began to think about this, there was a lot of information about Gren because all the others who had experienced this had told their children. And many of the veterans, as they got older in their 60s and 70s, wanted to go back to Gren and to meet the villagers and to thank them, which they did do. So people began to write accounts and, 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 and write books. But what I found is when I began the story is that everybody wanted to talk about this that all the children wanted to talk about this, uh, that there is a kind of, even in France, there's a general knowledge of what happened at the village of Grin, but no one, and there are some accounts, and I certainly thank the people who, tr who tried to write about what happened in Grin, but no you know, sort of professional historian, as, as a person that I've been trained how to look at things, uh, no one had ever tried to, to attempt it. Another key thing is that the mayor, the mayor, the longtime mayor of the village had collected a lot of German documents, but he didn't know, he, he couldn't read German. And so when we met him and as we were beginning our investigations, he and my wife kind of bonded and my wife reads German. And so he had all of the, what's called the Tagebuch, which is the daily log of the German, the, of 17th uh, Waffen SS. And, um, so just a lot of things kind of move together. The paratroopers, each individual paratrooper in their own hometown, eventually, I mean, the paratroopers became legendary. And people in small towns would look at paratroopers and they'd want to talk to them. And, 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 and so there were all kinds of stories and always local stories. So when I started looking at the newspapers, et cetera, at small towns where these paratroopers might have lived, there would be on D-Day a story about them all the time, and they would talk about what had happened in the village of Gren. I actually, as I did my research, I had a couple of cases where I could watch videos that the grandchildren of the paratroopers at Gren had made uh, uh, for their school projects, So, you know, where they would talk about what had happened 50 years previously, et cetera. So there was just an enormous amount of information so it was basically the type of skills that I built up as an historian for five decades. I just put them all to use to kind of bring all these things together. And, and of course, focus on multiple perspectives. I was glad when, when Chris said that it's very personality oriented. They look at you know the perspectives of the Germans, look at the perspectives of the French people, and they look at the perspectives of the paratroopers and to use multi-archival research to get into the perspectives as well as looking at all the material that had been left behind. And you just find all kinds of material if you really start, if you go into Find a Grave, which is a wonderful website. Frequently, if we, you look at, you find the, the, uh, the burial marker of a paratrooper, but then people post things about this paratrooper on the Find a Grave website. So you find all kinds of interesting information. So it, it became, I just, I was just amazed how I could get into all of this stuff. But in a you know, larger sense, I, I would hope that anybody who listens to this program, I hope that they read the book because I'd like to think that the book will make you feel good. It'll make you feel good about humanity. You'll make, a, make you feel good about people committing to other people for a cause. And um, the fact, you know, obviously I had the personal aspect that my father was involved in this, et cetera, but um, I just think it will make people feel, I mean, good. The other thing that we probably should note here is that a lot of new books about World War II are focusing on ordinary people, particularly women. And of course, there's a great deal of emphasis on women. We've had, of course, stories about the woman in Bletch Bletchley Park. Uh, we've had both the, the book and the film, film uh, A Woman of No Importance, about Virginia Hall. There's a new best-selling book called Three Ordinary Girls about, about um, um, 
uh, Dutch Girls Who Were Spies. And of course, one of your favorite authors, Lynn Olson, has written about Madame Foucault, et cetera. So there's been a great deal of emphasis to move the story of World War II from being male-centered to the contributions of all kinds of people, including, uh, you know, including women and children. Um, when they gave out all the medals at the, uh, after liberation, uh, Charles de Gaulle and, and the people who, uh, who took control of France gave virtually all the medals to men as resistance fighters, when cl quite clearly there were many other women, there were many women participating in the resistance to uh, the German occupation. So it's part of my book is also kind of part, part of the pattern of that. And then as again, as a professional historian, I was kind of, you know, I'm certainly aware that you just can't write from a male centered or great leader perspective that you have to look at the contributions of ordinary. But, you know, I feel that, you know, the book is doing very well in terms of sales. And I like to think that people are reading it. And after they read it, they feel better about humanity. So, Chris, I think it's you. Yeah. So, you know, when people buy your book and read it, uh, they're going to get what we've been discussing plus a whole lot more because there's a whole lot more here to unpack. Is there anything that you found out since or anything you wish that you put in the book that you're like, ah, I, I wish people would know this? Do you think that, that well, you would like to I, add? It, it, it is in the book. The most surprising thing to me was to to emphasize that at least the paratroopers, but I certain extent I think the villagers also, since they lost their village, is that even though World War II ends in an Allied victory, there is significant PTSD. Mm -hmm. Among the paratroopers I found, there's 100% PTSD. Now, these are the 82nd Airborne. The group that was picked to carry out the Allied victory parade down Fifth Avenue, uh, th uh, through Washington Square, through the Arch, down Fifth Avenue uh, in 1946 to represent the entire U.S. military. You surely, given the enormous honors that were given to them, they wouldn't be affected by the war. But the fact of the matter is all of them paid a very, very big price for what they had done uh, to liberate Europe uh, in 1944, 1945, 1943, 44, and 45. So it's one thing that that I think that I like to emphasize that um, that uh, even though this the Allied victory uh, did not resolve the problems of post-traumatic stress disorder, so that's something that um, I I like to emphasize that don't just make this all glorious. I mean these people these men paid a terrible price. Um, to just use an example of my father, um, at middle age something happened where he just stopped talking about World War II and he became afraid of water. And he told my brother, every time I see a body of water, a lake, the ocean, whatever, I see drowning paratroopers. So undoubtedly he saw a paratrooper drown on 6 June 1944 and it just hit him at middle age. A Silver Star winner ended up his days running up and down the halls of the assisted living uh, telling people, um, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming. A machine gunner, John Hinchelf, who's written about this, who wrote about this, um, who was a Gren, uh, in his 80s, after, his, after he became a widower, built a cabin in the woods of Wisconsin because he was afraid he would kill somebody, that he, he had such bouts of uncontrollable anger that he felt he would hurt somebody. So he just lived by himself with his uh, Siberian Husky dog. Um, and I have all sorts of stories of this. Every person that I interviewed or talked to their children, every person had post-traumatic stress disorder uh, because they had seen such horrible scenes. They had witnessed such horrible scenes. And um, I think it's something that's forgotten about World War II. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorders cannot be simply relegated to Vietnam or, or something like that. Um, uh, so, Steve, you know, and again, it goes back to which I'm glad you raised, Chris, about the personality factor. I'm interested in individual people and what happened to them, how they got there and what happened to them. S Steve, um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the, the one thing in the book that, that um, I, I don't want you to go back and try to rewrite it now, but the one thing in the book that was, that was missing for me that I, that I was sort of expecting was when I got to the chapter about the in-depth U.S. Army investigation into this, 
So um, I, I don't even really recall, and maybe I missed it, seeing anything about that. Was there any kind of investigation? Did any of these SS soldiers uh, ever get tried, or, or was, it, was there ever justice for the murders that were done? No. Now there are going to be there are a variety of explanations, and I didn't, and I didn't. It's something I can pursue in greater detail. For one, of the um, of the thirty seventh of the first battalion of the thirty seventh regiment of the Waffen SS that attacked the village of Grand, th there were probably about nine hundred people overall in the uh, battalion, and uh, about twenty five survived. They were almost all killed uh, over the next six, seven weeks in fighting in Normandy. I mean, they did lead an attack at Carata and were badly decimated by that. Uh, so one, a large number, there was an investigation and people came and interviewed villagers in 1947 and the villagers told them about the men being marched off, murdered, etc. On the case of the man who oversaw the execution, okay, who was a prisoner in Virginia, in which in the POW uh, barracks was, was all wired, as well as they had informers. They clearly identified this man, and he bragged about what he had done. My guess is, and I haven't thoroughly investigated it, is they determined, well, maybe this was a violation of the Geneva Accords to wiretap this person. Maybe we can't bring this evidence into court, etc. So overall, no, no one paid a price for what they did. No one paid a price. Um, the price that they that most of them paid was that that the 17th, uh, the Waffen S 17th Waffen SS was essentially destroyed over time in 1944-45, and the casualty rates were well over 90 percent. But it's you know, but of course we know so you know, you know so many people. I mean, the man who oversaw the execution of the nine soldiers, he died of old age in a nursing home. You know, just lived a long time, you know, he got out. And so, I mean, it, it does kind of stick in my craw, et cetera. I do think that the simple logistical problem is there wasn't virtually anyone left alive. But literally of this battalion, there were 25 men out of 900 who were living eight, six, seven, eight weeks after, after what happened between June 6th and June uh, 16th. Okay. One other thing I, I would like to very quickly note is there is some strategic significance to what happened in the village of Grand. It's yeah. just not a human interest. By slowing down the 17th Waffen SS, it gave the 101st more time to consolidate their control of Karata because the major mission for them was to recapture Karata, split Utah and Omaha Beach. So it gave them more time. And the battles of June 11th, June 12th actually kind of weakened and tired the Waffen SS. And so the 101st was be better able to uh, resist the attack on, on, on the liberation of Karata. The second thing I want to emphasize is that the villagers saved 110 people. And these 110 people participated in the liberation of Normandy, uh, the Battle of Bulge, uh, the jump over the Rhine River, and they liberated tens of thousands of slave laborers in German war industries in the Rhine area. And I think that's strategically significant also. And this is, is, is the, the work of the villagers. Well, S Steve Rabe, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and for a really fascinating conversation about your book, which is called The Lost Paratroopers of Normandy. Very readable uh, and, uh, and full of fascinating information. And we haven't really dived into it that much at all. So there's lots there that we haven't talked about. We appreciate your being here with us. H hang on for a bit, and we'll uh, we'll we'll give you a proper goodbye when we get off the air. But thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Steve. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Uh, Chris, we have uh, next week. We have we are continuing yes. live shows after having a whole bunch of oh, on shocking. and off again. I know yes. we have five weeks in a row of live shows, and next Ooh. week uh, we're going to talk to the author of the book resistance the underground war against hitler 
and uh, Max Hastings, who we mention frequently on this show, but has not yet appeared on the show, (laughs) says that this is the most comprehensive and best account of the resistance that I have read. I think it's an effort to to try to create kind of an overall history of the resistance against Hitler. So I'm looking forward to that. Are you looking for it on your shelf? I think you may have a... Well, yeah, no, I was uh, was going to say that she's... um, uh, Halle Kuchansky has also written... um, called the eagle unbowed which has for many years been my go-to history uh, of the war of poland's war um which is just an outstanding piece of work and i've just started resistance and this is shaping out to be just as as good as that so it should be a really great show so fantastic well listen you guys please subscribe to us on youtube follow us on facebook uh shouted us on twitter listen to our podcast back us on patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com thanks everybody be safe.